The religious tensions in England had reached boiling point just seven years earlier, when the king and his entire parliament had very nearly been blown up by Guy Fawkes and his team of Catholic terrorists in the failed gunpowder plot. And although Fawkes had been captured, some of the conspirators were still at large. It's perfectly reasonable if you're an early modern monarch to be paranoid about people trying to kill you. And James is one of those monarchs, there's no shortage of potential conspiracies out there. He's got a dad who's been strangled after an attempt to blow him up, a mother whose head has been hacked off in an English prison, and there have been at least two attempts to kidnap him, maybe one to murder him. No wonder he's scared. And shortly after he arrives in England, some of his Catholic subjects try to blow him to smithereens, along with the rest of Parliament. He's a king who is exceptionally nervous of conspiracy. The plotters who were caught were trying to flee to safety. And the place where they expected to find it was Lancashire. In March 1612, local JPs had received an order from London that they were to compile a report of all those who refused to take communion in church in an effort to root out the Lancashire Catholics. It was a crude but hopefully effective loyalty test. All those that do not come to the church and there communicate must be presented and further proceeded against. Fail not herein at your peril. And here, look, one of the order's signatories was Roger Noel. There's no question about it. On Good Friday, 1612, every loyal subject should have been in church. Instead, at Malkin Tower, Janet's mother threw a party and to feed the guests, a brother stole a sheep. Of course, there would be friends absent from the gathering. Alison and Granny Demdike, along with the neighbours, were now awaiting trial in Lancaster Castle. What happened in that house on that day will become the subject of intense scrutiny over the following months. There were guests at Malkin Tower. Was it an Easter party? just friends were out for lunch? Was it a solidarity meeting of those relatives of the prisoners held in Lancaster Castle? Or was it a gathering of witches? The local constable hears a whisper that there is a meeting of witches at Malkin Tower and arrives suddenly at the door with his men. Afterwards, with echoes of the recent gunpowder plot, they would be accused of conspiring to blow up Lancaster Castle and to murder its jailer. Everyone present was arrested, but the family at Malkin Tower did not come quietly. They told the constable that there'd been more people at the party who had left already. You'll never guess who you just missed. And so the others implicated were also arrested. They were all accused of plotting to kill a man by witchcraft. By the time he'd finished, Noel had sent another eight people to join the original four in Lancaster Castle. It was all going so much better than he could have hoped. Unlike some of the people detained, Janet Devis was definitely a Malkin Tower on Good Friday 1612. But she wasn't taken away with the others. The people rounded up at the party were from the lowest possible walks of life. But the others arrested were different. Alice Nutter was from a respectable landowning family and was arrested along with her sister-in-law, a nephew and a friend. The Nutters are still in the area. Colin Nutter lives here and many other relatives live nearby and always have. Collins, the Yorkshireman, I think I'm right in saying that there aren't many nutters in Yorkshire, but there are quite a few over here, aren't there? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, there are quite a lot of them here. So how did somebody like Alice Nutter come to be caught up in the witch trials? I think she was uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time, really, with Alice Nutter. What would Roger Noel's motivation have been? The Nutters at that point were a strong Catholic family, 
and uh, I think he would he would curry favour with the king and the and the powers that be if he catching Catholics as well. You see, she had two relatives who were priests who were hung, drawn, and quartered. And one of them in Tyburn and one in Lancaster. So as far as Noah was concerned, she was just a, another one of these troublemaking Catholics then? Exactly. And she would be used as a pawn for his own ends, really. It seems pretty unlikely to me that Alice Nutter and her friends spent Good Friday eating stolen mutton at shit towers with the local beggars. But whatever the truth, they were rounded up, arrested and taken to Lancaster Castle. Lancaster Castle has remained a working prison right up until spring of 2011. This is still known as the Witch's Tower. The castle is huge, but the cell that they were held in wasn't. Inside it were all of Janet's family. A gran, a mother, a brother, a sister, plus all the neighbours, Chattox, Anne, Isabel Roby, Margaret Pearson, Alice Nutter, John and Jane Bullcock, and Catherine Hewitt, plus eight other prisoners in a space 20 feet by 12 feet, 20 people in all. As for Janet, we don't know where she spent the four months that her family were imprisoned. It's possible that she lived under the protection of Roger Knoll, as she was about to become crucial to the case he was building. The magistrate would have been well aware of the king's thoughts on witch hunting. Right at the end of his demonology, King James wrote something that became especially relevant for the case of the Pendle witches. And here it is. Here's what the, the king says. In my opinion, barns or wives or never so defamed persons, that's children, women and liars, all lumped in together, um, may of our law serve for sufficient witnesses and proofs in matters of high treason against God. That's telling Noel and other magistrates in the country two really important things. That witchcraft is treason, not just against the king, but by extension also against God himself. And secondly, he's saying the law should allow children to testify in court. And it wasn't just Noel who was influenced by King James's demonology. It would also influence the professional justice system. Everything we know about this whole story comes from one book, The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster. It was written by one Thomas Potts while serving as clerk to the court when the prisoners went on trial in 1612. He kept his notes of the trial and wrote them all up to demonstrate the rigour of the trial proceedings. He also dedicated the book to his patron, Thomas Nivett, Nivett was the man who arrested Guy Fawkes. Potts was making a clear connection for the reader between witches and Catholics as traitors or terrorists. The whole book is an exercise in political brown-nosing. Nonetheless, it represents an extraordinarily detailed account of a 17th century witch trial. In the courtroom of Lancaster Castle, on the 18th of August, 1612, the trial of the Pendle Witches began. The room is still a working court. In 1612, it wouldn't have looked much like this. Nonetheless, there was a judge, uh, in fact two judges in this case, uh, a jury, witnesses and the defendants. And all the while, Thomas Potts was scribbling the verbatim notes which would become his best-selling book. The outcome of the trial was far from being a foregone conclusion. Probably less than half of accused witches actually are 
convicted and executed. And the, the set of records which we have which are very reliable for this suggests that it's probably more like a 75% acquittal rate. Whatever the odds, for Janet's sister, whose curse had started the whole affair, things didn't look good. Poor Alison Davis. She didn't even want to defend herself. She was completely convinced of her own guilt. Her words had caused the peddler to collapse, and that terrified her. She was asked in court if, through her magic power, she could restore the peddler to his health and strength, but regretfully, she said that she couldn't. She did say, though, and others agreed with her, that her grandmother would have been able to help him. But in the four months of waiting for the trial to begin, Granny Demdike had died in the tiny, filthy cell. Thomas Potts had some sympathy for Alison. He liked his witches desperate and contrite. Her mother was neither, and Potts was vile about her. He wrote that this odious witch was branded with a preposterous mark in nature, which was her left eye standing lower than the other, the one looking down, the other looking up, so strangely deformed as the best that were present did affirm that they had not often seen the like. 400 years ago, it wasn't common for a witness to be brought to testify in the courtroom itself. But on the 18th of August, 1612, a star witness was being prepared to take the stand. Elizabeth Davis was furious and protested her innocence. But then a nine-year-old daughter, Janet, was brought to testify against her. Elizabeth was distraught. She yelled at her desperately. Janet burst into tears. She was only a little girl after all, before turning to the judge and asking that her mother be taken away before she would speak. Once Elizabeth had been silenced and Janet had her audience, she jumped up onto a table and calmly denounced her own mother as a witch. When I was a probation officer many moons ago, I spent a lot of time sitting in the Crown Courts of Lancashire, a lot of them old and intimidating cockpits like this. And some of the cases involved evidence from children and of course the legal system these days is very sensitive in its handling of young people. We'll never know why Janet Davis said what she said, but standing on the table, centre stage in the middle of this moral and political and legal drama, I can't help think that she was reciting her lines. My mother is a witch, and that I know to be true. I have seen her spirit in the likeness of a brown dog, which she called Ball. The dog did ask what she would have him do and she answered that she would have him help her to kill. John Robinson of Barley, James Robinson, Henry Mitten. Janet went on to describe the meeting at Malkin Tower on Good Friday. At 12 noon, about 20 people came to our house. My mother told me that they were all witches. She described the food they ate, and named six people she'd seen there whose names she knew, as well as a mother and brother. There's a kind of a, a paradox surrounding the evidence of children in the courtroom. On the one hand, they're seen as unreliable because they're so young, but on the other hand, they're seen as pure witnesses of the truth. And so that in something like Janet Davis, it's something horrific about exploiting a child who is so young, and I think people may have felt that at the time too, but at the same time, um, she could well be the means to cracking open this secret ring of witchcraft. It wasn't just Janet who testified against Elizabeth. Her son James denounced her too. He said that three skulls had been robbed from graves at the new church in Pendle, and four of the teeth then kept at Malkin Tower. Four teeth were then presented in court which had been found at Malkin Tower by the constable, alongside a clay figure, all buried together in the ground. But giving evidence against his mother wouldn't help him, because Janet turned on her own brother too. 
Janet said that James had been a witch for three years. She had seen his spirit kill three people. <laughs> 